Hello, everyone. Welcome to Women Seeking Wholeness Wednesday. I'm Cherie Burton, and this is a podcast for women who long to feel expressed and be who they truly are. I would add to that humans. This audience has blossomed to many male listeners, which I love. This is episode 117, and today is very special because number one, it's Easter week. Something's been missing quite central to this narrative that has been looked past for millennia, and that is the fact that Jesus came to a woman first. And not just any woman, but Mary Magdalene, who you all know that I love, (laughs) who really is this lost heroine of Easter, and that's the title of this episode. I'm bringing in Jamie Walters. She is someone who I've been following for a while and had the opportunity to get to know. She is such a prolific writer, intuitive, so many things around the divine feminine. And I would say my main draw to her was her work with Mary Magdalene. Her blog is called Sophia's Children, so you can go check that out. But she focuses on lots of different topics like reclaiming ancestral wisdom, restoring our humanity in all areas of our lives, things about sacred relationship, which is a different take that we'll kind of talk about in today's episode. Just all things like engaging and embodying the spiritual self, the physical self through the expression of the divine feminine. So that's kind of how she helps you reconnect to your, what she calls your divine spark. She has this calling to help alchemize the great turning, capital G, capital T, that's now underway, providing a lantern for those on the sometimes rocky paths of transforming themselves. So yeah, today we're going to talk about Mary Magdalene, the rise of the sacred feminine, why Mary is relevant in our day, why she's making this resurgence, restoring what Jamie refers to as the holy she, capital H, capital S, what that means and how in times past we haven't necessarily been encouraged to seek for her in our hearts using this knowledge of the history and the embodiment piece of the divine feminine can lead us to actualization, to self-actualization. So really beautiful, yummy stuff today on this episode. Also, I just wanted to let you know that I'm doing a giveaway this week, beautiful clutch bag with a bunch of essential oils in it. Because y'all probably know that I have this other life (laughs) of sharing essential oils, aromatherapy. I've devoted a huge part of my career to understanding multisensory healing. And so I started a new Instagram account called Cherie Soul Essentials. So a big focus of it is essential oils, but the focus really of this new account is to talk about health. I'm now in the second half of life. I'm 52 and I still am raising young children, a first and a second grader, as well as having older children. So there's that mothering piece of devotional self-care. I wanted to create just a whole conversation and community around beauty and coming into your physical embodiment in beautiful ways and making self-care, which I know everybody has a trigger around that word, but more like self-nourishment, things like small yoga tips and DIY recipes and just a whole beautiful lookbook, if you will. Uh, So go to Cherie Soul Essentials on Instagram and follow that and that will enter you into this drawing. And if you're on my Women Seeking Wholeness Facebook group, there will be some more information on how you can connect to Soul Essentials, uh, Cherie Soul Essentials on Instagram. So look for that this week. I'm really getting intentional about teaching more around the biochemistry and multisensory healing aspect that I don't necessarily really get into in this podcast, but I will get into it more and more as we open these conversations around devotional self-care. So without further ado, let's bring in Jamie Walters and talk about this great turning that's underway and how Mary Magdalene, being an alchemist herself, teaches us ways that we can be part of this great turning by alchemizing our body and soul as one, leaning in to the holy she. Jamie, I so appreciate your willingness to hobnob and co-partner in crime with me to a great extent on this deep dive quest here. You were um, just the first person I thought of when I wanted to go a little deeper on the topic of Mary, Mary Magdalene. So thank you. Well, thank you for the invitation. I'm always um, so truly delighted to be in conversation on these things, and I'm I'm grateful to you. So thanks. 
Well, you and I have had um, months of email exchange. Um, you've been pivotal in my journey to help me understand how I fit into the stars with <laughs> my birth. And, um, also just uh, your beautiful blog that I'm just going to go ahead and direct people to now so they get a visual if they happen to be near a computer or if they want to take a note. This will be in the show notes. It's Sophia's dash children dot com and it is the and i've told you this this is the most beautiful resourceful alive researched gorgeous uh blog for the divine feminine that i have uh happened upon and i've seen a lot so <laughs> thank you and it's rich with a lot of imagery which i love mm -hmm. i don't know where you find all this art Oh, it's really fun to go sleuthing for the art that speaks for any given post. So, mm. well, it's just beautiful how you've put it together and you're a great writer. And our, um, so my friend, Chloe Mercer, who lives out in England, who I met in Glastonbury, she's the one who directed me to your blog and I'm so grateful. So that said, <laughs> why don't we start? Because, you know, you and I are both real fans of Mary Magdalene. Fans is an understatement. So how did she happen upon your path? How did she show up for you? Why was this a, a focus for you? Why was she a focus? Oh boy. Um, I think she came alive to me in a new way, probably in the autumn of 2005. And prior to that, probably for a lot of people, and I had been also maybe for the 10 years prior to that, um, really delving into the pre-Christian or Jesian, if you want to call it that, the wisdom, you know, uh, what, what was it before Rome? And so I was starting to see different types of references to Mary Magdalene from the ones that I'd grown up with, you know, uh, which was in a pretty traditional, you know, perfectly pleasant, which is fortunate, Christian <laughs> household, um, not evangelical, you know, and I'm, I'm sure other people have had beautiful experiences with evangelical traditions, but, um, there's not a lot of mention of the feminine at all in Protestant, mm -hmm. uh, Christianity, um, except for the side mentions of, um, Mother Mary and Mary Magdalene as the penitent prostitute. And the whole smear, and you call it a smear campaign. Like we yeah. just grew up with this notion. She was this prostitute in the process of repenting and somehow sought out Jesus to absolve her of that prostitution background <laughs> sinning. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, it was that, and not even, even a lot of time spent on that. So so when she really came full, I was already, um, you know, five years, not quite five years um, after a near death experience um, and already in the midst of a journey to seek and quest and reclaim and see differently. Uh, kind of following intuition on those kind of things. So that were really was when I joined um, Andrew Harvey in Apela, Colorado, and a group that was then affiliated with what's now Ubiquity. He's um, done, I just have to insert here, Andrew Harvey, yeah. have all his books. He's done some amazing work with, didn't he write The Great Cosmic Mother? Yeah, and the return to the, return the mother to and know. the Christ. I mean, you know, everything he, he, was, he writes uh, about oh. Christ mm -hmm. is so beautiful. And the fact that he's a man and he's doing all this work with the mother, I love. <laughs> I it's mean, amazing. He's, he's, he's so in touch with his feminine and I just, I love everything he's contributed. So the fact that he, you got to be studying with him is fantastic. Yeah, it was. I mean, and it came about through um, some real synchronicity so that I ended up there and that the um, intensive itself was several weeks in France. And then I actually kind of continued on to Barcelona. But, you know, in France, delving into the Mary Magdalene, the um, the Dark Madonna or the Black Madonna and the Divine Feminine Traditions. 
So let's just for our listeners really quick here insert because you say dark or black Madonna and some people don't don't have a reference for that or they may, you know, make some assumptions that aren't founded in how actually spiritual and beautiful that that is. So maybe just for our listeners, just a little brief um, insert here on what that is and what the dark or black Madonna is. And how it relates to France. <laughs> Deep question. <laughs> well, France is one of the places where um, there are many Black Madonnas um, who, and that was really a tradition brought in from points south. I mean, it comes from a deeper um, African tradition and wisdom tradition and of course so many of our ancestors if we go back far enough you know we're going to find our ancestors having roots there as well and mm -hmm. what's now called the middle east um which doesn't consider itself the middle east that's sort of our eurocentric reference to it but you know all of those came um and some people are familiar with the cathar uh, came from those people who went questing say on crusades and came across a different type of tradition a deeper tradition and came back with that um, and that was profoundly not what was uh, available in the church whether it was related to magdalene or whether it was related to the black madonna which is just that you know so that's both literal and honoring of our own deep um, dark and brown skinned ancestors, mm -hmm. which helps us to perhaps um, honor and heal the current racial absolutely um, toxicity and all of those things that have come over the years. I mean, whether it's with all of the isms really come from that same toxic root. But um, so, so, the the, so there were all old, these. Yeah. All of these artifacts that were found of a dark skinned Madonna. Definitely. And so um, and especially it's really concentrated in that region, right? In France. Yeah. And there are others throughout um, Europe. But, you know, so you had the true traditional depiction of Mary, the mother of Jesus, Madonna and child, um, very often depicted as a very fair skinned um, Mother Mary, and also in the tradition itself, uh, elevated as this kind of transcendent, unreachable feminine, right? So um, where the, so it's one facet of the feminine that was sort of um, convenient, maybe to focus on and, and make as the uh, predominant vision of the feminine that was allowable or the one we were supposed to strive towards. And the dark Madonna or the black Madonna, um, sometimes in Greek iconography or others, you see more of the olive skinned is truer to the roots. Um, and it's, but it's also, there's a literal and there's a symbolic, you know, so with the symbolic, for whatever reason, even within the Catholic churches, you see, you know, where they'll be in fenced in, you know, um, metal gated, very controlled settings, but still accessible to those who have access to the inner sanctum or those who are let in for a very short time to, you know, walk by it or pray um, for two seconds with it. So there's a tradition of that being very powerful. And to me, you know, you start going into the deep, uh, what sometimes is called the chthonic, right? You know, very, very deep earth connected wholeness. Mm -hmm. So to me for the, the Black Madonna, in its symbolic or metaphorical energetic or essence is um, the deep whole feminine. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the feminine that includes death and regeneration and the cycle of life as mm -hmm. not something scary um, or to be feared, although, you know, sure, that's understandable. But um but as something that is part of the cycle of life and there's a deep mystery to those thresholds between birth, life, death, regeneration, birth, mm -hmm. life, death, regeneration. So it's something that our deeper feminine ancestors and some male ancestors as well would have understood completely. Um, 
And so the Black Madonna, just like the Magdalene, coming back up literally like a plant growing back up through the soil and a crack in the pavement that's been paved over it, you know, and you see this green shoot that comes up through the crack in, in that pavement is coming back into our collective psyches and in our own remembering, like our deep DNA and body memory remembering. And I always feel like it's the perfect time you know, so mm -hmm. there are waves and waves and waves of it coming up and then kind of sinking back or being marginalized again and then coming up um, because there's that remembrance of wholeness that we're all yes. on the path of. Right. Because yes. it needs to be remembered and also translated and lived anew for these times um, in order to really heal some of the things that most profoundly need healing right now. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I I love everything you're saying. The 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 depth, the richness, the fertility. It's all mm -hmm. dark. Yeah. It's all um to be earthed or to be, you know, it's it's not unearthed yet. It's not reborn. It's it's um generating. Yeah. It's gestating. And when I look at the Black Madonna, because I happened to go to one of the shrines where she was heavily guarded and cased yeah. in, in <laughs> it, you could feel I mean there was a story about a farmer who kept you know, found it in his field or something. Can't remember how many centuries ago. And then he found it and he did something with it and it came back or I don't know, I'm, I'm totally butchering the story, but it was a very mystical way that this wanted to be found. Um, and so he, you know, passed it down and it ended up in this shrine at this church. But it's so interesting to me that we're so afraid of the dark, mm -hmm. all things dark, um, and we'll get to that because I do want to talk about the relevance to the dark night of the soul, but I'm still curious how Mary Magdalene found. So you went to these regions, you, you studied yeah. there, you went to Spain, you went to France. Um, there's so much, people understand there's so much rich history about the seed beds of civilization, pre-Christianity in these regions. Um, and then of course, post-Christianity or well, it's still pretty Christianity, right? Jesus and Mary Magdalene were not Christians. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. That would be the, yeah, Jesianity for him or whatever we'd want to call it. But yeah. Mariology. The, the earlier traditions, indigenous traditions, I mean, yeah, wisdom traditions before it became called Christianity and then before it, um, Rome Romanized the religion um, and, you know, we kind of inherit it from that and the best of it and the worst of it and the neutral of it. So, but yeah, so we're looking way, we're looking back at the roots of the Christian or Jesian and Mary Magdalene, et cetera, tradition, which also then had deeper and more ancient roots themselves. Yeah. You know, they were right. students of that. Sure. Um, and also I, you know, this episode is airing right before Easter. And I was intentional about, about that because mm -hmm. Mary Magdalene gets left out of the Easter story at every <laughs> turn. I certainly, <laughs> I mean, I went to church every single Sunday for decades on Easter um, only to be a bit disillusioned that she's rarely given even a mention mm -hmm. when, and maybe we could go there next as you're comfortable in, sure. in your in, in your deep research and your lived experience and your um, identification with her, both historically and archetypally, what, how, why is the Easter story different when we look at it through the Mary Magdalene lens? Wow. I know it's such a big question. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, it's different in a lot of ways. I mean, it's different because we see it in the deeper writings, you know, I mean, and it's kind of, it's like the elephant in the room, really, because we hear, I mean, it's in scripture, for example, you know, Mary Magdalene is the apostle of the apostles. She was there anointing. She was there when all everybody else ran away in fear. Um, she was there at she's the tomb, which is what Easter is. You know, she's there in some cases, some of the Orthodox still have a richer tradition of both Sophia and Magdalene um, in the stories, not unmarred by patriarchal or um, misogyny is probably mm -hmm. a better word. But 
you know, so when we talk about Mary Magdalene in the Easter story, she's there, you know, I mean, she's there, she's the first who sees. Mm -hmm. um, and then we could say, well, you know, why would that be? You know, um, but she's the first that sees go and tell the others. Of course, they don't believe her because they haven't yet seen themselves and they have to deal with their own ego and misogyny. In that yeah, and that's a that's a recurring theme throughout the Gnostic texts. <laughs> sure. <laughs> that she is continually um, I would say more more about it's more about Peter when you agree, like, you know, because he was just this rock and this, you know, this masculine structure around um, and follower of Christ mm -hmm. and very adept in his own right as a leader. But here comes this feminine force and this uh, wisdom teacher, really, that she was. That she was yeah. looking in the inner worlds and she mm -hmm. was going underneath. And so to have a woman out at every turn knowing something that he doesn't or that they don't, um, including the teachings themselves, not just his appearance to her at the tomb. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah definitely. And in the, right. The Gospel of Mary Magdalene, Jean-Yves Laloup and his two co-writers go beautifully into that as well. And I feature um, just that in a post or two on Sophia's Children. But it's a it's a radical remembering, you know, um, and again, it's right there. It's just wasn't what made it into the spoken or emphasized traditions. Um well, and then not in the sermons and not in, the, you know, whatever we he heard when we're sitting in the pews. I want to just, yeah. And I want to yeah, just read something here from one of your posts about Mary Magdalene. And yep. for those of you who go to Jamie's blog, you can look and just do a search on Mary Magdalene and find so much richness around this. But I'm just going to read this one part about, and as it relates to Easter. Um and, and you have as a byline, one who gets it, quote unquote, gets it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, Mary Magdalene is also portrayed and, portrayed and seen in the various gospels as one who gets it. One who has truly understood and experienced the teachings of the wisdom master, the rabbi Jesus. And you talk about the scholar John Lamb Lash exploring this in depth in his writings on why Mary Magdalene matters in this mm -hmm. resurgence of the new feminine or the feminine rising today. Um, yet Mary Magdalene, as you say, according to the gospels and more recently scholarly writings about her was one who in addition to an emphasis on the inner mysteries engaged in the world yeah. she is portrayed as a teacher and adept yes and also as one who is devoted in action it is she with two other women for example who don't flee the threats at the crucifixion they remain there present witnessing and perhaps holding the space through their attention and devotion it is magdalene who goes to the tomb with the sacred oils it is she mm -hmm. it is to her that the risen uh, christ first appears and gives the instruction to go and tell the others as you just mentioned because she is the one who has seen, literally seen. And I mm -hmm. would say, you know, seeing inside, like the to the deep inner space that, you know, the inner mysteries or the inner sanctum, the kingdom within, as well as seeing with her physical eyes who Jesus really was and the and the true things he was trying to teach, as well as seeing him first at the tomb. Absolutely. I mean, and, you know, the, even even hearing that is funny when, you know, we hear or revisit our own writings. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, did I write that? You know, like, woo, all right. <laughs> but um, also, as and you can probably understand, and many people who are listening can understand that when you revisit something, you have the experience between writing it and now. So you can sometimes see and hear and sense in a different way. But um but one of the things too, like, yes, on all of that, for sure. Um, and that's there to find, that's not some radical worldview, but the other thing too, that if you look into that, um, with the, the, uh, gospels that were buried, thankfully, so that they didn't get burned, um, you see, and if you look into other traditions or ancient um, traditions that were making the same sort of remembering headway with, you see that it might have been more of a partnership. You know, we even right now, you know, we see Magdalene, an adept who gets it, learning from and understanding what Jesus is talking about. 
And, you know, one of the things that I might suggest is that that was a two way street. You know, because if you look at adepts and priestesses of that time who were very aware of and initiated in the mysteries and the anointing and the vibrational medicine and the holding of the space. Absolutely. How the masculine works with the feminine, yin, yang. um, Then you see that if you look at Jesus's mission, that you can see that that's a very difficult thing to do without somebody who is helping to hold the space, uh, hold and create and co-create that energy. So I would suggest even listening to what you've just shared from my own blog, for God's sakes, Mm -hmm. just now that we might invite ourselves to see even more deeply into how that mutually beneficial partnership where both were bringing their gifts, their understanding, their initiatory um, experience Mm -hmm. and their training. That's such a good point. I I feel like one of the things that gets left out of the story of Christ, Mm -hmm. because, you know, you and I both know the true history is like, it was all oral traditions. All of the biblical texts we have were oral histories that were passed down and and the four gospels weren't even recorded until a generation, almost a hundred years. I think it was 70 or 80 years after Christ's death. And it it was not written by Peter, James, or not, sorry, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mm -hmm. Um, it was, they, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were dictating to scribes who, you know, anyway, yeah, so with that, a lot got lost even before the Romans took over, right. And decided what was to be kept and what was to be put aside. But what I like about what you're saying about that divine partnership is we don't like to think that Jesus would have taken counsel from someone, um, that he would have studied with other wisdom teachers and gone all over the world or that when I mean, we just think he downloaded everything he needed. Right. Um, and that's not to be of the earth. That's not, that's not necessarily the way that it happens. And to think that Mary Magdalene could have contributed to his, to Jesus's knowledge mm-hmm. that what she learned, like you were saying, the act of, the acts of these ancient priestesses and this, um, the divine feminine lineage and, and what was taught in these spaces. I mean, she had a lot as a feminine being and with her training to be able to contribute to Jesus's mission. And I see her as a Christed female. That's just how I see her. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, we can use a lot of words in exploring it. There's a really, uh, you know, it's a wonderful conversation and energy, And particularly because we're doing that in a whole body, not just linear analytical thinking kind of way. But yeah, you do like a putting together or recreating a mosaic. You know, you're taking different types of pieces. I mean, whether they're coming up out of the ground and a different type of more true uh, archaeologist is looking at them. Um, they It isn't just that sort of little club mm-hmm. that's interpreting all the findings. So we're seeing them come in theological scholarship and you know, we're just putting pieces together in a lot of ways. So including the ones that were also honored um, in those times and before, which is what comes up in and through the intuition or from nature or from the worldview that they had and understood that all things are created and all things speak. You know, so whether, you know, Jesus was probably getting downloads, absolutely spent a lot of time in meditation and prayer. I have no doubt about that. And um, the notion of sacred relationship, even then alive in the traditions of the Teleste, you know, or what irritated traditionalists about the Cathar, uh, you know, that they went out a man and a woman a team together to teach and share. So, um, and there are historians who make their lives looking into each of those different areas and, and have a lot more depth and it comes through their lenses as well. But so we, if we put all those together, we can start putting together uh, a little bit more of a whole view of what might have been. And that mm-hmm. to me, uh, you know, includes that notion of sacred relationship where this is something I'm so incredibly passionate about, even speaking it, I can feel it rising up in me again. Um, 
if we're talking, say, about Jesus and Magdalene, particularly in this story, and see them as teleste, pairing together in sacred relationship, where as other indigenous traditions continue to understand even today, you get a third spirit. And I've written to this in the beauty way mm -hmm. of relating and the third spirit of relationship when any the two where two or more are gathered, which we touched mm -hmm. on before we started recording. Yep. Um, the third spirit is, you know, a more potent combination. It's a great gift to the community. So when you're saying a third spirit, it, are you saying like a, a body of of no. teachings or are you saying a literal like manifestation of a being or what? what no, I say so, so like let's uh, in because we're talking about Jesus and Mar Magdalene in this story. So in sacred relationship, I mean, they come together, they both have their energy, they have their training, they have their heightened understanding of the interconnectivity of all things that everything speaks. Um, and so each one of them has an energy field and a body of knowledge and a purpose and they come together working together even and there's a third uh energy field correct got it uh, yeah that's you know that's I mean? kind of what there's i thought you meant like, just, right yeah. um so they fuse together or share together each of their gifts and their energy fields um and you get a third and mm -hmm. the third it has you know may have its own combined purpose of them together um it doesn't you know they might continue individually but it's very powerful gift for the collective field you know or mm -hmm. the community to whom they're speaking and being present with you know even their presence yeah so yeah it's well, just an it's... incredible notion and we all have that capacity to see that way um, yeah that's a beautiful way to put it. it kind of reminds me of a trinity type of relationship absolutely um, <laughs> funny like that huh god the father god the mother us jesus the organic divine masculine mary magdalene the organic divine feminine us <laughs> also yeah. that third energy that that is created outside of an actual being but it's just like we all benefit from that combined when we try to compartmentalize Jesus's teachings and Mary Magdalene's teachings, it's not as nearly as powerful as when you put them together. Absolutely. So, um, yeah. so with, um, I know that I think you mentioned this too in your blog, like the Da Vinci co code kind of brought, thank goodness for Dan Brown. <laughs> I know. But he kind of like it's put very, it out there in the consciousness, him. like, to where it opened up a conversation that there could have been that sacred relationship between Jesus and Mary Magdalene, right? Um, yeah, I mean, and what was great about Dan Brown is he really brought it to a lot more people who um, might not have been reached by the some of the wonderful theological, you know, scholarship that men and women um, were doing in those things. So Dan Brown just like cruises it right through to, you know, the book you pick up in the grocery store you know, or <laughs> Barnes and Noble. Yeah, it's on Netflix too. So yeah, let me get that. Exactly. Well, yeah. And it's so funny. I, I just, um, as soon as I, it just came, what year was that? I'm trying to re even remember what I was doing in my life or when that was, but I was just like, well, of course they would have had a relationship if she was first at the tomb. There was something deep going on there. And it makes sense that they would have been married because the term rabbi is for a married man, right? And there's so many other things. But when I actually traveled to France out of just sheer feeling called there and curiosity, um, it was like, and you and I talked about this before, there's just such a knowing in that region of France, those regions of Southern France of of this relationship that they had and of Mary's being this ascended, uh, Mary Magdalene being this ascended teacher who really um, came in as a, a, a an adept, as you said, a, a leader, a teach, a master teacher who picked up the baton from Jesus after his death and carried the teachings forward. Um, what, I guess with that, <laughs> How is this going to get even more? How does Mary Magdalene, why is she showing up even stronger? I would say now it's almost like, okay, hello. Everyone's heard of her, but what is the relevance of this particular time? 
for the feminine with Mary Magdalene? What is she actually, in your view, given all of your vast, you know, writing and research and, and lived experience around this, what do you think she is, why is she coming through so strong right now? Uh, oh, I just got the shivers. Um, me too, actually. And I just took a drink of my tea. Like, <laughs> so she heck? really, yeah, it really is. She She's really is. Right now. Right now. I can <laughs> feel it. Like, there's just an energy to that. It's a presence. It's a felt stirring inside of us. Sure. Well, I mean, if you discuss her, it is, and you can feel it like you felt it. I felt it. Um, perhaps people are listening now. will feel it. Um, you know, if you look at Jesus, um, as an embodiment of, or an example of the Christ, you know, Christed mm -hmm. energy. And you look at Mary Magdalene in that tradition, uh, the pre tradition, the Orthodox still have some of that as an embodiment, as some people at least have suggested of Sophia, the divine feminine, you know, then, and you look at a time period um, that's been going on for quite a while. I mean, there it's called a lot of things, whether you want to call it, you know, the patriarchal or Roma's Romanized rule, uh, you know, pick what you want. But it's also gone badly off balance. You know, because the whole point is yin and yang. You get one or the other, it's out of balance it, um, if it completely disregards or marginalizes or suppresses, oppresses the other. And we're at a time where there are some fairly toxic and disastrous or potentially catastrophic effects of that. So it comes through strongly because life, having the incredible omni intelligence that life capital L has, needs to have that infused balancing medicine, you know, like in the five element um, traditions or yeah. the Qigong traditions. Which they all uh, kind of temper each other and they all absolutely. need each other. Balance. There's a codependence, yeah. Codependence right. in a good, healthy way. <laughs> right, absolutely. You know, I mean, out of control, Yang burns everything down. Mm -hmm. You know, it just consumes energy until there's no more to consume. So and it would be the same with um, a complete imbalance on the other side. So the whole point of life having the intelligence that life has and waking up um, those necessary remembered energies and ideas um, to reclaim and translate and embody anew for these times is just part of that balancing element or healing and healing. It's healing. I mean, it's not even healing yeah. energy. So Mary Magdalene coming back into that story. Um, I'll be careful what I say here. Coming back into that story in a tradition that was taken very much off center in terms of the unfortunate misogyny that found its way into the tradition. Now, there are a lot of great people who are wisdom carriers throughout that. Um, and I honor them for that. But um, so Mary Magdalene coming up so strongly, the Black Madonna, the Dark Madonna coming up so strongly, um, the, you know, Holy She, the divine feminine in so many other ways coming up strongly um, is vital for putting the whole back into a sustainable, healthy balance. Mm -hmm. And it does that through awakening through people. You know, mm -hmm. we're like acupuncture needles on the body of the earth, right? <laughs> so, or <laughs> stones in the sacred healing bag. I mean, we can pick our metaphor. But yeah, so Mary Magdalene arising back in the um, the collective awareness, but now with so much more um, coming out of, you know, uh, theology and other types of remembrances and just coming out of the collective with Dan, with Dan Brown's book and things like that. 
um, reminds us that things have been misinterpreted and they were misinterpreted for a reason and to serve a particular agenda. Now we can yeah. say that was just perfectly part of what everybody as a whole needed to experience. You know, the Kali Yuga, you know, thing it's called by various names in different traditions. Um, but whatever it is, it's time to, to bring it back into balance and to understand as we are in so many different ways um, that there's been something left out of this conversation, someone left like, out of this conversation, yeah, like a huge voices piece of it. <laughs> left out of this conversation, yeah. right? Ways of seeing and sensing and feeling and being left out of the conversation. And it's time for them to become part of the conversation because it's necessary. You know, we need to heal it. We need to bring it back into balance. And, you know, we're just beautiful vessels <laughs> for yeah. that. And it gets a backlash, you know what I mean? <laughs> well, but... it's, it's, it, it's, it's borderline heretical to say there was a Christed female. There was an ascended feminine master next to Jesus. That doesn't bode well in a lot of, you know, traditional settings, including not just in religion, but in a lot of spiritual communities and homes, right? Absolutely. Um, so I, <laughs> I get it. And, and, and like, now it's just so self-evident to me that there was this beautiful partnership. Um, I don't completely understand it. I don't know that anyone does. Sure. It's just so um, alive in me to be able to attach to like what we've been searching for, both men and women, what we've been pining and, 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 and scraping for really like energetically and hungering for is to have a woman to have a feminine figure, whether you want to call her mother, whether Mary Magdalene uh, is representative of the divine mm -hmm. feminine, Sophia, we all want that. Men want their mother just as much as women do. But women in particular, having that, you know, been this the subject of these smear campaigns, starting with Eve, the blatant sexism and misogyny you're talking about, the silencing. Right. It's aggressive. Um, that aggression because when I say heretic, I'm like, I, I, I take that as a compliment now mm -hmm. because I want to, I don't like the aggression. I don't like the marginalization. I don't like it. It no longer resonates for me to take a group of people and make them more exalted or elite than another group. That's what I love about what you write about Mary Magdalene being in of the world in a good way yeah. of the earth, right, of Let's say the earth, not the, earth, the world. <laughs> um, she was, she and Jesus both were with the people. They weren't hanging out in the synagogues. They weren't hanging out at church, quote unquote church. They were with the people. They were in the trenches. And that to me is so beautiful and so liberating. It is. It is. I mean, all of that and more for sure. And they are the tradition of like the Teleste. What and is others. the Teleste? Explain that to me. Is it, it's from the word celestial, right? <laughs> I yeah, have some semblance of what that means. Sure. I mean, it's, you know, illuminators, mm. right? Those who help shed light. So, you know, there are a lot of those words in different um, cultures and traditions. So, even looking at that tradition, which existed, uh, one of several that of the, that kind of thing that existed of people who were teachers or, you know, we might now say way showers or illuminators, which is what guru means in its truest and deepest sense. Um, and they met at houses. You know, we there are a lot of stories, even from we're talking only in the Christian tradition. Um, I understand uh, the the Quran also um, honors and includes some of these stories um, about Jesus and Mary, et cetera. I'm not an expert on that, but I um, honor and respect that. Um, but we are needing to remember these things because it was excised, you know, and I know a lot of people are uncomfortable with it and I know it challenges what so many, even now um, here, uh, I understand that. I do too. And I try to be sensitive to it, but I'm just so passionate. <laughs> like, it's like, well, I yeah, I mean, because it's time and I know it's uncomfortable. And, you know, my question would be why so much fear generated about that notion? Right. 
You know what, what I does mean? that what does that threaten and challenge at our right. deepest psychic? Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. You know, and it's difficult to ask those questions because they open up um, cracks in what feels like our foundation. Sure. Um, so I, I do have empathy for that. And also I know that it's important to be sharing, be talking, be experiencing, be inviting, be in conversation with on these things, um, as so many of us now are. Right. It, like you said, I think that you hit it on the nail. It's time. Yeah, this it's is, time. This is freaking 2021, right? We just had 2020. We just had, we're in COVID, like we're coming out of COVID hopefully, right? It's yeah. this incubation. I, I always, you know, I've heard massive takes on this whole, like we've been in incubation, we've been in quarantine, whatever, isolation, and it's been a gift. And um, we were already on the precipice of this whole awakening even prior to that. And now we're in the age of Aquarius where I mean, you and I talked about this before we started recording, but um, this ushering in of a new era, a new way of, you know, when I had my experience in Costa Rica, which you're going to help me, that you have been such a light for me, even coming into that experience. And now you're going to help me process some of it. <laughs> but, um, you know, when I came home, all I cared about after that transformative experience was mm-hmm. love how I was loving others, how people were, I could be loved or beloved. Mm -hmm. Um, And I just, it was like a huge love fest with my kids and my husband. And I went and saw my, drove down and saw my parents and like connected with my siblings. Like, I'm just like, wow, it really is that simple. And that's what Jesus and Mary Magdalene were like, as profound of an experience I had. And as much as I've dove deep and researched that as you have over the years on the divine feminine, what it comes down to is how do I receive love and how do I give it? Mm-hmm. And I include from the divine. And I want to ask you something about that. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> because you used a beautiful phrase in your writing about um, seeking for her in your heart. Mm-hmm. Now I was raised to seek, for Christ in my heart, which is a beautiful, of course, we love, you know, that's Christ consciousness, that's Jesus, it's the master. Mm -hmm. But I was never encouraged to seek for her in my heart, meaning Sophia or Divine Mother, there's many Mm -hmm. names, right? Even Mary Magdalene. I have sought for Mary Magdalene in my heart and it's gotten me to this point, like (laughs) all over the world and starting podcasts and doing all this work and writing about her. And it's like, cause I sought that in my heart. I didn't find it in the teachings. I didn't find it in church and Sunday school. <laughs> right. Certainly yeah. not sitting in my chapel on Easter Sunday. Mm-hmm. But when I went into my heart, there was something there. And I'm assuming that was your experience as well when it comes right down to it. Cause you and I both have something in Pisces in common and I forget what it is. <laughs> is it Chiron in Pisces? <laughs> and there's Chiron, something else we got in yes, common. That was the, uh, for that core gen- generation X crew, the Chiron in Pisces, the Uranus Pluto conjunction. We also yeah, have a lot going on there. We also have a Gemini moon in common, right? The what that? It's a Gemini again. moon. Aren't oh, you moon. a Gemini moon? Yeah. The Gemini yeah. moon. Yeah. yeah. So we'd like to take a lot of things and like from multiple sources, like. Yeah. yeah. And also, you know, going back through that, um, long, long line back through our, um, ancestral lineages, um, when there was an understanding and in many cases, women in the communicator, uh, women in the communicate, the communities were the holders of that, that everything spoke. You know, you're in conversation with everything. We just have forgotten that, right? Um, so it's really a beautiful thing. That's what, you know, astrology, the wisdom tradition of it can be um, a mirror in some cases of some of these things. Sure. Yeah. But for you, the practice of finding her in your heart, how mm-hmm. did that illuminate for you? <laughs> you know, it goes with the transformative experiences, which I know we... Um, touched on and yeah because that's part of you know we like to think of it always you know we just kind of this theme pops up and we explore it and we you know check it out and research it but really those are active and enlivening and and, um, catalyzing archetypes because what that does I feel 
is activate a remembering that's deep in our bones and our blood, you know, in yeah. our bodies. Um, so can I just read what you have on your, that qualifies, as you say, for a transformative experience, and I'm sure there's a wide yeah. range, but near death experiences, Kundalini like yep. awakenings. Yeah. Um, what I just had in Costa Rica, which was this, if you call it an EPT, epically transformative <laughs> event. <laughs> and then also just the as descent into the underworld, the initiation into that dark night of the soul. Right. Which I have spoken extensively about on this podcast. But anything that mm -hmm. alters the way you used to look at life, how you conceptualized it, and mm -hmm. then you have either a, a series of you know, like um, an underworld initiation can go a long time or it can be very short. For me, it was about a three year span. Um, yeah. Or it could be just over a weekend or it could be in one sitting, like a shamanic journey or something. Mm -hmm. um, so I just wanted to kind of qualify what we mean by transformative experiences. So keep saying what you were saying. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of we need to have those, right? We need to have those to get out of the box we're in. To get out of that, uh, yeah, life. absolutely. They're the things that help to deconstruct. Sure, you know what I mean. And that's like if I, if you use the metaphor of pavement over the top of a green space, you know, or over the top of something that's been buried, and you know, somebody wants to keep it from being found, or make it harder for it to be found. I mean, any of those metaphors, then whatever cracks that pavement, you know cracks through conditioning and deconstructs worldviews. So it kind of opens us into our body, opens us into our heart, opens us back into a right brain or lunar capacity. And, and like you said, it activates that's right aspects of our soul that are ancient that right have our remember you know, we come into a remembrance of something. Absolutely. So, I mean, in transformative experiences, I mean, there can be lighter touch ones, you know, that transform at some level. And then there are the sort of deeply non-negotiable shatterings, you know, that would be mm. near death experience or real Kundalini um, type of awakening that, you know, the lightning bolt itself um, might be an event, you know, we could say a date, right? Mm. But the after effects of that, it's really just an initiatory, a catalyst. And you and you have to go, what I'm learning is you have to go into a uh, season of deep self-care afterward, because um, not only are you exhausted, mm -hmm. um, but it's like this cosmic <laughs> um, thing you've tapped into that you that's so big that it takes a while to catalyze in you. You have to integrate it. And yeah, so you have sure. to take a step back and, and really come into mm -hmm. your inner sanctum again <laughs> and, and just yeah. take the world as you know, it, that's still happening. <laughs> you know, kids are still going to school, right. dogs still pooping everywhere. Like, and I don't know why I brought that up, but it's just like my life <laughs> because um, that's the day to day. day, -to -day. <laughs> Those are the day to day realities. Yeah, nothing, nothing in my periphery changed, but everything inside of me did. And I have to find my new normal. Um, so yeah, yeah. And that's a living into too. I mean, those are the sort of things that, you know, the linear mind wants to map it out. But the whole point <laughs> is more of a deconstructive kind of thing you know when you deconstruct what is left what's always been there right mm -hmm. and then um living so you're living into those questions is more the case it's a little bit of a lighter touch a little bit more of an organic experience right yeah because you it's almost like you just went through shock like you had a death experience <laughs> totally. right and it was like Absolutely. a shock it was positive mm -hmm. but it epically altered everything that you your being right <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, uh, you know, ev yeah, everything that gets built from that or created in your life um, before that will often either transform or deconstruct, you know, so it's easier. It's a, so much easier to look back after years yeah. because then you can really see 
a little bit more of that when yeah. you're living it, you're just living it. You well, know? So yeah, you're kind of very busy with that. <laughs> sure. And you're trying to go linear with it and you're trying to analyze right. it. Now, when I'm, when we're talking about the dark night of the soul initiation, um, I think I mentioned to you probably have a lot of listeners who are ready to answer that, which is just mm -hmm. an opening. Really. It's, it's where you start to, deconstruct everything that you thought you knew it's an awakening of sorts but you can go into a descent very very rapidly yeah as you start to see illusions you hadn't seen before things you accepted as truth that no longer resonate so i think andrew harvey is is the one that took me um who was a great teacher for me in that i think he had a course or something on it and and he said it's literally like cataclysmic it's um mm -hmm. It's like <laughs> a murder. It's like killing parts of you that uh, are illusory and that need to go. But it's it's the ego trying to still still stay attached to that. So um, when you enter this, it, it's it's not just depression, right? It's a soul alchemy. <laughs> yeah, for and, sure. Um, so I always try to ground people into that when they're in it um, because it's. Some people can become um, suicidal. Yeah, I certainly had that happening at various mm -hmm. junctures where mm -hmm. you thought it was going crazy. Yeah, yep. um, I remember that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> every I talked to so many other uh, Teleste. I love that. Now I'm going to use that illuminators who who had to go through this initiation into um, for to receive further light. Really to go into that underworld journey and, um, mm -hmm. and to have somebody to hang on to while you're in it, to tell you, you're not crazy. You're actually, I think one of the teachers I talked to on this podcast, Liana Silver, she's like, you're a sane person in an insane world, really. When you have mm -hmm. that awakening and you realize that you were buying into some pretty insane ideologies. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. I mean, there there were traditions that made space for those kind of things. We're kind of stumbling our way into the remembering of those. Um, and it, yeah, it, it's, it's a little, it's both the same and it's different for different everybody because, you know, we all have our own part of the overall great purpose that we bring and collaborate with one another often unknowingly in doing um but the dark nights for real yeah you do <laughs> you know, have are neurological like yeah. neurologically you can your brain changes yeah uh, that's what's so cool about the um I, I mean i love the neuroscience and the research that's coming out particularly like andrew newberg dr andrew newberg's work in um that correlation between neuroscience and contemplative or transformative experiences. And there have been different t types of things too. That's a really promising and positive thing because you do see, uh, that's like with near death experiences um, mm -hmm. and some NDE like they call them, you know, where like Gopi Krishna wrote about his own just sudden kundalini awakening which is mm -hmm. what they called it in his tradition um and trying to figure that out and how long that took and right. um and then it sharing doesn't... that with others but it's very deconstructive and we talked a little bit earlier about um the whole feminine and how for a long time what they what was it, it was like a control freak kind of thing like you want to control and prevent things from deconstructing um which means they can't really regenerate very easily so that Part resistance this, it's that Absolutely. resistance yeah right so you know something a little bit more abrupt happens and that's been part of um where you have community healers who are born into that purpose and have uh, or julian of norwich you know and many many um, women mystics um and what's now called shamans although whatever it was called in their own uh, wonderful traditions where there were often real illnesses um near-death type experiences transformative ex like epically transformative experiences mm -hmm. um, and initiations to and can they continue sometimes you know because we can easily become um sucked back into the overly analytical sure 
the ego um, protective mechanism. Yeah, of course. And, you know, the ego is kind of important. It's it's how we sure. interact with the world, but it's not meant to be the master. That was, uh, I think, Albert Einstein has been quoted as saying that, whether that's true or not, it's still brilliant, you mm-hmm. know, where the um, mind is supposed to be the servant of the intuition or body wisdom, and we've made it the master. Okay. So... Um, so those, all of those types of experiences we're talking about based on our own, you know, purpose and the, where we are in our journey, whether they're, you know, a little bit more of a lighter touch, um, a tweak, or whether it's just sort of ground, like yeah. just decimated. And I, I think, <laughs> and you got to figure too, your way out of that. Yeah. Well, the only thing that really grounds me now Mm -hmm. Um, I have a smattering. I mean, I have so many books around me that I haven't, you know, dipped into and I love books. I love gathering stuff. I love reading. Mm, Yeah. But ultimately, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, it's Gemini moon. Um, but ultimately it's this, um, centering in the wisdom way of the heart or the, um, the heart is the, the wisdom keeper for me and certainly the womb wisdom for that as well. But it's Mm -hmm. just, it kind of goes back to what I was saying, you know, seeking for her in your heart. Right. Um, and certainly him too. But I mean, this mystery of, you know, who am I? And, you know, how how does the divine manifest through me? Right. How can I be a vessel? And uh, when I, that's the the most basic way I can get out of my head. Cause you know, I'm very analytical and I'm always, mm-hmm. I think I've asked you a billion questions over email. Um, <laughs> it's just, I, I understand. It's like, yeah. I know you get me now. Cause like mm-hmm. you're like that too. So yeah. how do we, let's, let's kind of, you know, package this up for people. <laughs> We've gotten so many directions, but I feel like we had a great <laughs> trajectory of just Mary and the Easter story and then mm-hmm. finding tradition for yourself that fits and flows and illuminates and that's such a sacred um path to Mm -hmm. sort of extrapolating and, and gathering for each person but if you could tie this together for us just about I mean, because I love everything you said about the sacred relationship. How do you get that sacred relationship into your being, you know, from the feminine, the masculine, the yin, the yang, Jesus and Mary Magdalene, if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, How have you found sort of alchemize that within yourself as maybe a practice or a tip? You know, that's a very overarching thing. There are probably a million things, Mm. but what just comes to your mind, maybe? Um, I... I think living Rilke's advice to the young poet living into the question is the really the way because putting it and we can be guided to practices. You know, uh, books will appear, um, fellow experiencers and journey, you know, journeyers on the way, lantern holders um, as part of that, because that's part of everything speaks. So when you're in that zone, things arise synchronously mm-hmm. and at perfect timing. So, um, where we want to sort of put it into a, a, an order, th- it's quite the opposite of that. You know what I mean? It's much mm-hmm. more organic and alive and kind of, um, interactive. So, I think the, the, the advice of living into the question itself, mm, just being in the mystery. Question, absolutely. Questions. It's an interactive conversation. Um, and it's not very comfortable. Like, <laughs> no, not, not, not usually. I mean, definitely not sometimes particularly, but also really liberating that there are not these definitive ironclad black, white, literal answers out there that we all have to ascribe to. Yeah, which sometimes can feel really annoying, right? Because you want that because that gives it clarity and it makes us feel comfortable and safe. Um, But it's like Eve Ensler's book, you know, Insecure at Last. I loved that so Mm, much because I I resonated with it so much. (laughs) It's fabulous. Mm. Um, And some really great excerpts and quotes out there from it as well. But that's the point. You know, all of this construct that was created to try to control and to fit what felt secure um, and yet created imbalance, um, mm-hmm. we're learning to tolerate the, and, and live concurrently with, 
you know, that which is unknown, that which is mysterious, that which can't always be controlled. Darn it, it often sometimes. just has to be felt. Right. Felt and lived. And um, it's like being in an ongoing interactive conversation because, you know, you might see you might hear and sense and feel or have um, dropped into your lap through some wonderful synchronicity. Um, the answer that's correct now to your question and next week or next month or a year from now, it might be completely different because that's what life needs. You know, yeah. it's a dynamic energy field, a multifaceted one, right? Mm. Um, and so restoring that balance and what's best at any given time is part of that conversation. And we're servants of and conduits for that. So we're in constant conversation. And that's why questions can be, you know, there are like some pretty what's what are called dangerous questions, mm. you know, <laughs> because you're asking for something out of your heartfulness and out of your intuition out of a need um, often too just a sacred need absolutely you're asking a question and then it becomes very inconvenient <laughs> to the, con <laughs> the conditioned construct of our ego <laughs> because well it's sort of i like, you know <laughs> and so. also just like I was that person from the time I was a little girl raising her hand in Sunday school, raising her hand in young. Uh -huh. hand I hear you, church. sister. <laughs> it's like, um, excuse me. And then I got shut down. So I just stopped. Yes. Yeah. I understand completely. I mean, there's a joke, you know, that my first question, my first word was why, <laughs> you know, followed by why not. So um, I don't know that that was true, but it certainly, it certainly suits mm -hmm. and asking uncomfortable questions in places and of people who, um, were uncomfortable with that, um, or at least maybe just even know, didn't know what to do with it, you know, and yeah. then some who just kind of absolutely clamped down, you're not allowed to ask that, which is sure. sort of like Tinder on a fire, like I'm not allowed to ask that. Like oh. As soon as you get more enlightened, then you can ask that question. As soon as you double down on your spiritual practices, come back to me. Right. Or you like know. many people have heard, you know, you can't ask that question. That's not for women to ask or that's not for, you know, fill in the blank to ask or to know. Right. Right. Um, and there and, and followed up with like by, you know, leaders. Hey, you right. know, there's just some things that are not revealed to us right now. And I'm like, well, they can be. Absolutely. I reserve the right for that to be revealed to my heart in my own way. Absolutely. And with the perfect timing, because that's what it is. Sometimes we force things and it's not quite as um, graceful as it might have been if we didn't. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's one, wh however we open that door it is how it happens. So I trust that that's correct. But, um, and, you know, beautiful. so really the practice would be living into the question. Mm. You know what I mean? How does life want to flow through me right now? How does mm. life want to flow through me today? In this you know, moment. How can, absolutely. <laughs> how can I show up? Um, one of the things that I loved, you know, is how can I be more and more myself, you know, mm. and, and have that be medicine today for somebody or for something. Mm -hmm. And they're powerful questions. You can feel the aliveness in your body, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's I a great practice that. in and of itself and journal it and then watch what synchronicities come up. Watch what dreams you have. Watch what aha moments. Mm -hmm. Watch the people you're, you know, what uh, that you connect with or what you notice. Um, watch where your intuitive surfing leads you, as so many of us have experienced and how we connected. Right. Yeah. And if I could just prompt a question for people maybe right now to live into <laughs> as sure. a practice is what is if I am drawn to learn more about the different thine feminine why why does this resonate with me if if it sparked something when we you and i were talking about mary magdalene if if somebody got chill bumps or they had a you know physiological response mm -hmm. why and yeah, uh pay attention to it because um mm -hmm. that's also reclaiming the things that our wise women ancestors knew fully well in their body that's the body wisdom the yeah. yes we kind of raised up above into our heads and there's no um, space for body wisdom sometimes and i want to qualify this with so much love as i say this to mm -hmm. any listeners who are active in their religion there really isn't a lot of space in religious settings for embodied wisdom to come forward other than discussion from existing doctrine. So living into, yeah, and it's, and I've been in that painful mm -hmm. space. I've also been in this space where I was totally illuminated and edified and fed in church. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I want to, you know, balance that. Um, 
but just when we're when we're talking about restoring the feminine like a literal restoration it is going to be a bunch of organic movement within the space of these traditional patriarchal settings that is going to illuminate more truth um so speak up <laughs> you know be that person um definitely it's, it's ask it's the uncomfortable point. questions right yep. ask ask make make them squirm in their seats a little bit mm -hmm. because we need that we need to shake it yeah up and i know bit. when you talked when you spoke about the book that you're writing um shri mm -hmm. too said that you wanted to ask those questions or you had been asking those questions and also you know bringing a compassion and an empathy um with that which is very whole mm. you know because a lot of people feel maybe i mean it's afraid uh, afraid because it's you know what you've believed it's what helps you to feel safe and questioning jeopardizes that but one thing that i would say too is that restoring the feminine capital f or whatever we'd want to call it um is restoring wholeness it's not um as it has been it's not anti you know no. it's kind of pro sake because really under the current system the sacred masculine doesn't have a whole lot of space either no you know what i mean in, in so, the rank and file no right absolutely so really um it's a it's to recover one is to recover wholeness you know i joked at one point that you know you can't have a holy marriage when the bride's not at the altar she's kind of <laughs> locked up in the basement or the attic someplace <laughs> and which reminds me of that wonderful um quote and it was uh young her name but she said you know it she was talking about when she turned 50 and ha and which is the chiron return generally and yes she Ugh. said you know 50 i want to go when, through that again <laughs> yeah 50 is when the wild woman in the attic who's been locked in the attic kicks the door down stomps down the stairs and sets the house on fire <laughs> you know can i just say that literally happened in my life two years ago oh no <laughs> i'm 52 now i totally relate it started at age 50 49 and ended at around age 51 yeah yeah yeah, exactly. Chiron return. Hello. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's a life milestone and, you know, different, again, different for everybody, but I love that. So again, I just want to say that to reclaim what has been excised, suppressed, marginalized, oppressed is really to invite wholeness, which benefits sure. everyone. It's a right? gesture of love. It's not combative. Right. Yeah, it's and that doesn't mean people won't need to be challenged or corrected or asked uncomfortable questions. And it doesn't mean sometimes that we have to step away being um, a part of something that mm -hmm. just isn't ready to grow. Sure. Right. Right. And we have to take care of our own soul. And if our soul feels, I don't want to say violated, maybe that's not quite the right mm -hmm. word, but if there's a level of deep uncomfortableness, that's not edifying, then you get to remove yourself from that setting. Yeah. Um, maybe it's a sabbatical, maybe it's a permanent thing. Only you can determine that. I'm certainly not telling people to jump ship necessarily right. only to be the light and allow the conversations to unfold. Mm -hmm. um, and I certainly am writing about it. So absolutely. And I, I am a little scared. I'm going to be honest. Like I'm a little, but yet, you know, perfect love casts out fear. So I keep going back to this is beautiful. about love. So, well, Jamie, this has been beautiful. Um, gosh, we talked forever. I might have to break <laughs> this into two parts, but I know that my listeners are just going to, oh, they're just going to love this. They're going to just feast on this discussion. Um, thank you. And let's remind our listeners where they can find you and some of the offerings that you, that you have there on your site. Sure. Sophia's children. So S O P H I A S hyphen children.com. And it's really a cyber garden, you know, where I it's planted. Just, I can just <laughs> stay in it. I'm loving it. I, I can just play in it. Yeah. So, I mean, and it really is like, as I was moving through and discovering and experiencing, you know, things that I was moved to share. So really it's, um, a journal of sorts of those kind of things, you know, lantern holding, what I learned, um, what mm. I experienced, uh, things that I found helpful, perspectives. And you that do dive shared, into so. mystery. I love that you do yeah, explore for sure. mysteries. Yeah. Yep. 
and ask the questions. And you ask the questions. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, yeah, I'm sure you and I will be continuing our friendship and our discussion, but thank you again for your presence today and for your wisdom teachings. Thank you so much, Cherie. Um, I have enjoyed the conversation and I know we'll continue having wonderful conversations. I appreciate and love what you're sharing and thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate everybody who's listening because if you're listening, you're um, a conduit and, and vessel too. So thank you, thank you, thank you mm -hmm. so much. Thanks again to Jamie and her blog is sophias children Com. So please go check that out and get fed with so much yumminess around the divine feminine. Also, just remember that, uh, and we touched on this in the episode, that the dark earth, the darkness, the gestation, the, the dark mother, if you will, and I refer to her in the episode as the dark goddess, or I have in times past. All my episodes are kind of running together. But the gist of it is that this aspect of us is so integral, going down and down into the depth so that we can be rebirthed and regenerated. And to me, that's the real beauty of the resurrection story and all that Jesus taught Mary Magdalene in her teachings in the, in the gospel of Mary. It's all there. I believe that's one of the reasons he came to her first, because she understood this on the deepest levels. Not only that, but he loved her. So happy Easter. Hope that you find time to go and tell in your own way as the one who quote unquote gets it <laughs> because we have this embodied wisdom that we can access at any time. And to me, the miracle of the Easter story is showing us the way to overcome spiritual death and teaching us about regeneration and new life. And here we are in the spring, moving into this new life and embracing that. So seek her in your heart, seek the feminine, seek the dark mother, if you will, and dark, not in the evil sense, as we know, but just that beautiful connection to all that is still point creation, the womb of the cosmos, if you will. Thank you for listening. And remember, it's not Cherie Soul Essentials. It's Soul Essentials to Cherie on Instagram, where you can uh, go follow that for all the natural beauty stuff and all of the devotional self-care elements and tips, tricks, hacks, and whatever that I'll be sharing there in that beautiful lookbook on Instagram. We're doing that giveaway this week with the beautiful clutch and the oils. So please visit that and have a glorious week. We will talk to you next time on Women Seeking Wholeness.